Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. Thanks for joining me today. This is Bob Gallion from Gallion Kruger Amplifiers. Great to see you. Great to see you, sir. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. I'm Appreciate happy it. to be here. Your son Forrest is going to do some playing for us, right? He sure is. Yeah, yeah. we've got some amps to check out. Yep. And, uh, yep. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the the story here. I. I uh, I just don't, I'm blown away. I'm, I'm trying to imagine a uh, Stanford-educated engineer with an amplifier on stage with Carlos Santana at uh, at Woodstock. That had to be just like an amazing event. Yeah, I, I actually, it, I had no idea how significant that was going to be. Right. You know, who who knew? You know, I that amplifier, uh, I had built it in my garage. I was a player myself, not much of one, but, and uh, I was a student at Stanford at the time. As you mentioned, I was also an engineer at Hewlett Packard. Okay. So I was doing a lot of things, and uh, I took that amp into the music store across the street from Stanford, and the guy wouldn't buy it, but he said, "I'll take it on consignment." I had no idea what that meant exactly, right. but, but I said, "Well, okay." And uh, oddly enough, the very next day, this local musician, Carlos Santana, comes in and he buys it. Hmm. I didn't know who he was either, really, at that time. But the dealer called me, and he ordered another one. I'm thinking, what, I have to make another one? <laughs> How long is that going to take me? Right. But, uh, yeah, the amplifier actually was really an, a unique for its time, more, more so than I thought. It was 200 watts. A big amp in 1968 was, what, I, with Fender Dual Showman, I think, might have been right. 100 watts. 100 watts or, or so, Marshall or whatever, 100 watts, yeah. Yeah, and so this thing was huge. But the other thing about it is it had way too much gain. It was my first amp that I ever built. I didn't even really realize how much gain it should have. But when you let it go, it would sing forever, hmm. which is where those sounds on those first Santana albums came from. Right. You know, they, that singing guitar, they just wouldn't quit. So uh, that was really the first amplifier that actually behaved like that. Right. Next thing you know, uh, uh, he's uh, at Woodstock. It's uh, the Santana band is on the album cover. So my amp's right in the middle of the album cover. It's in the movie. And, you know, I just built one in my garage. <laughs> so um, all of a sudden I had a company that... Uh, had a demand from professionals right mm -hmm. from the beginning, mm -hmm. and uh, we just continued on in that way. I finally had to quit my job at Hewlett Packard. Right. I finally graduated from Stanford, and <laughs> was able to devote all my time, you know, to this enterprise. Right. Been doing right. it ever since. And through the years, so many firsts and innovations. I mean, everything from just the format of the amplifiers to a thousand watt bass amplifiers. I mean, you guys were the first ones to do those really high powered bass amps and things that were out there as well. And the lightweight uh, uh, designs that you had and things. Lots right. of innovations through the years. Yeah, yeah. The lightweight was a big part of it. Being a player myself, I've hauled up amps up back stages of you know stairs of back stages and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, getting the weight out was really important to me. Right. And uh, of course, being an engineer, uh, from a high tech engineer, you know, uh, improving the uh, state of the art was also, you know, always big with me. And I always wanted to um, find ways to not only make the amp more reliable and lighter and so forth, but to make a sound that would punch through the mix. A lot of amplifiers, uh, even to this day, sound great in your living room, not so hot in the mix. Right. And so we're, our, I kind of think of our amplifier as more like Ferraris, you know. They're not really so great in your living room, but you get them on the stage and they're awesome. They do the job. Yeah. Right, right. And I, I think that uh, sometimes it's hard to keep that in mind that there are two different things there. You know, the, I think of it as bedroom tone is one thing and it sounds good when you're, you're playing, you know, yeah. in the, the bedroom along with the uh, recording or, or practicing or whatever, but getting that to work on stage, like you said, is really a different thing. Yeah, it's, it's, so it'll sit in the mix and uh, it's really designed for a more articulate player. Mm -hmm. you, you know, guys that are just starting out, they're not very happy with our amps because they <laughs> reproduce everything. They're very fast. If, if you're not, you know, polished enough to really be able to hit your notes, uh, you know, you're probably not going to be too happy with it. But, mm, interesting. Uh, so, yeah, we have a, a huge following of accomplished players, you know. They want 
those nuances to come out. Right. Yeah, it's a, the range of players that uh, endorse and, and use your amplifiers is, is really pretty astounding. I mean, everybody from Flea to Dave Holland to Slipknot to Def Leppard to yeah. jazz guys and metal guys and rock guys and yeah. country guys and, and uh, you know, such a broad range of styles. What is it about the amplifiers that lets them work in all those different situations? Well, it's kind of what I was saying. Uh, the, am the amplifier is fairly neutral. You know, and it'll put out what you put into it, and it's immediate. So good players, whether they're Christian or rock or uh, jazz, like you say, uh, they gravitate to it because it's easy for them to play it. Mm -hmm. they, it, it I, I learned early on that a good player will sound good through anything, but they got to work harder. And they gravitate to our amplifiers because they don't have to work so hard. You know, the amplifier will just cooperate with them. Mm -hmm and it lets them be more creative. They don't have to work with the amplifier, they can just you know, focus on doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So what is it about the amplifiers that allows that? Is it the way you're setting up the tone control so they can easily dial in? Is it more the amount of power? Is it the way the front end responds? What is it that, that allows the amps to work like that? This isn't a short story. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, we got all day. <laughs> Okay, so uh, it's a lot of things. It probably starts off with the power amp. Uh, our power amps from the very beginning have been really high tech. They're not like anybody else's power amps. And uh, they go, there's a thing that we engineers call the rails, which is an amplifier can reach a certain amount of power and then it starts distorting. Mm -hmm. Okay, they would call that hitting the rails. And uh, Nowadays, I'm not so sure, but in, in the 80s when I, and 70s when I started doing this, amplifiers, they, if they hit the rails, they would hang on the rail, and then they would snap off and make a spike, and you could hear it instantly as soon as the amp touched the rails. Mm -hmm. Our amp, my designs, I made sure that when it hit the rail, it would stay on the rail as long as it had to, but when it was supposed to come off, it came off immediately. So it didn't make that snap, it sounded more like a growl. Uh -huh. And there is a term that the industry, the players uh, invented, they call it the GK growl. It didn't come from me, but it is. And when you run it into the rail, you hear that unmistakable growl. And it's badass. It sounds great. Mm -hmm. And so that's the start. And then there's the power supply itself. It has to be a certain hardness, but not too hard, so that you get punch. So when you let go of the string, you get this really punch from, like when you play a guitar or bass without an amplifier, it sounds a certain way. You can hear when you let go of the string. The amplitude of the note is a lot larger than what is, happens like another second later. So our amplifier power supplies are kind of soft and they're really high voltage and they re reproduce that first transient and then the supply will sag, but it sags along with the note. So even though our amplifier might be rated, let's say like, well, the famous one, the 800 RB, was rated at 300 watts, but it sounded like 600 watts. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so it, we got a reputation for our amplifiers sounding louder than what they were supposed to sound like. So people, you know, said we were underrating our amplifiers. So you know, that's not entirely true. We right. just gave it an honest rating, RMS rating. Uh huh. So as you get away from the power amp and you get into the preamp, the next thing you're going to deal with is the equalizer. I spent two months by hand doing the calculations for this equalizer. It's a pile of paper this thick. Hmm. Uh, nowadays, of course, you just do it. We have software that just does it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but in those days, <laughs> you, you had to know how to solve differential equations to solve these things. And I love doing that because, you know, I was a Stanford student and really, you know, wanted to use all that stuff. So anyway, the equalizer in all of our amplifiers since the 800RB is what's called serial variable Q equalizer. Mm -hmm. It takes, uh, depending on how I implement it, 40, maybe 50 parts. Now, anybody 
in the industry could put that kind of equalizer in, but they don't want to put more than 10 parts in the equalizer. And there's a fair amount of understanding of how these kind of equalizers work to, to make them, but nothing that couldn't be done easily by other engineers today. So the stages in the amplifier, there's a, you know, there's a bass, low, mid, high, mid, and treble. When we first did this, amplifiers had bass, middle, treble, and right. they were passive controls with seven or eight parts. So this kind of equalizer, they're not really bands, but I'll call them bands, but the knobs are all in series, one after the other, so mm -hmm. they don't interfere with one another. But they can stack. If you tune up the, the high mid and you turn up the low mid, they'll all go up kind of together, but they won't interfere and cancel. The way a graphic does, they cancel and have all kinds of ripply effects, which some people have tried to put in their amplifiers, which I think graphic equalizers are equalizing rooms, not instruments. Right. So I wanted to make an equalizer that was designed to equalize an instrument, not the room, not mm -hmm. trying to fix problems with the room. So it needs to have a wide range. So as you boost, let's say, a mid control, the Q decreases as you boost it. So it gets fatter sounding instead of, like a graphic, you boost it up and it sounds like a tin can ringing, right? Mm -hmm. That ringy sound. So you won't get that out of, a, out of our equalizer. It'll just get fatter and it will boost. So, and, and it, then if you, as you boost or cut different controls, they just sort of work together. They'll add together, they'll subtract together, but they won't interfere with one another and cause a cancellation or a resonant peak. That's why they're in series. The disadvantage with an in-series equalizer uh, is that they can be noisy. So guess what? Okay, you gotta use really good components. You gotta have a really low noise circuitry before it, otherwise you're gonna get a hiss bomb. Mm -hmm. So that means everything's more expensive. Right. Okay, so that's the equalizer. Uh, then as you go in front of the equalizer, you get into the front end of the amplifier. Okay, well, so that thing has got to be quiet. In our early amplifiers, I used to build a discrete op amp out of discrete parts, because it was regular op amps, way too noisy to put there. So I would build these discrete op amps with a really high headroom, uh, they would, it would swing 60 volts, so you could put anything into that. And so you can get a really low noise, and it was FET front end, so which <laughs> FETs in 1968, or, well, I'm sorry, this was 1980, what I'm talking about now, pretty rare. Mm -hmm. But you know, they were very quiet, very good sounding, lots of headroom, wouldn't clip, and then that would be what's in front of the equalizer. So that's the basic suspension, so to speak, of the amplifier. There's a lot more than that, but sure. that, those are the rough strokes right. of what goes into making an amplifier sound good. Then if you're going to make a digital amplifier, like, our, like these, you got a whole new problem. It's not all that, you can't just stick a digital amp, power amp on the output of a, of a preamp and expect it to work like an analog power amp. Mm -hmm. they just, they're totally different animals, so there was a whole new restructuring of, this, of the uh, topology to make the digital amplifier perform like an analog. They're different, for sure, sure, sure. Than, than analog amp, but I think we've done the best job that can be done. Yeah, definitely, and of course the, the big benefit is the lower weight that you get with oh, the digital. Oh, yeah, sure, what, seven, five to seven pounds? It's crazy. It is crazy, <laughs> yeah, it it's is crazy. crazy. So, so one of the things when you, you bring all those together, of course, there's the technical side of it and there's the stack of papers and the differential equations, but there's also the ear to yeah. dial the sound in, and being right. a player yourself, that had to affect what you were going for with your amplifiers. Well, it got me in the ballpark. I, I, I am a player, oh, I was a player, but I wouldn't call myself a player by today's standards at all, even though I did earn a living doing it while I w worked my way through college. Uh -huh. I have an ear, mm -hmm. you know, and I can tell what's right and what's wrong, but believe me, I use the input from a lot of players, not big stars, but just local players that play a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, and get because they help me a lot. You know, sure. getting getting EQ points in the right place, and and just a, a lot of things that you know you wouldn't normally think of. Right. In the last two years, we brought out twenty one products. Okay. Of which there's uh, six heads. There's, if I can remember this, ten combos. Uh huh. And five new cabinets. Okay. Uh, they were all designed together at the same time by me. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough. That's a wide variety of products right. you know, to get for one guy to design, but the way it worked is they use a lot of common parts. 
So uh, the parts in this head and the parts in that head are almost the same, except the front panel's different and the preamp board is different. Everything else is the same mm -hmm. inside. Just doing that enabled us to have a wide variety of products. So like in the heads, we've got three tube heads, a 500 watt, an 800 watt, and a 1200 watt. Mm -hmm. And in the solid state version, same thing, 500 watt, 800 watt, and 1200 watt. Using mostly the same metal, but just printed differently. Okay. In the same thing then with the combos, I'm using the same power amp, same boards inside to make the combo chassis. It's just a different piece of sheet metal. 10 combos, you'd have to buy 10 different kinds of metal parts. No, nope. one part we just laser printed at the beginning of the mm -hmm. line. Right. So the combos go with, see, 112, a 115, a 210, a 212, and a 410. And uh, of course, those are all different cabinets, and they all have different speakers, but we make the speakers. I think we're the only company anywhere near our size that makes their own speakers. I, I imagine there's some big companies that do, but sure. uh, you know, we're not a big company. Uh, but we make our own speakers because we are low volume. Mm -hmm. So we, once again, we can buy common parts, but we can assemble different kinds of speakers out of those in low volume to suit our low volume products. That's one. Two, we can make the speaker uh, exactly what we need for our cabinet. Anybody can do that, and before I made my own speakers, I used to travel to the people that made speakers and work with their engineers, and we would come up with a you know, really, really good speaker. They can make anything you want, mm -hmm. and any quality. Those guys that make these speakers, they're outstanding. The problem is, you don't know what you want until, at least me, I didn't really know what I wanted until I played around with it and put it in a cabinet, hooked it with an amplifier, oh, that speaker's not really gonna do what I want. Oh, I gotta go back to Kentucky and talk to those guys. So if, in making my own speaker, I can discover what I'm doing, what I want to change, and I'll just change it. All right. And I'll put a different spider in there or, you know, play around with the cone or whatever, you know, and, until I get it to where I want it. And the other thing is, uh, especially in this new product line, we wanted the speakers to not fail. They can handle a lot of power. Well, how do you do that? Well, you got to use an expensive voice coil. It's called Edge round ribbon. Ed, edge round ribbon. <laughs> Say that three times. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and uh, to make an edge wound ribbon voice coil, you've got to stack a thing that's like a ribbon on its edge and wrap it around the, co the coil form. You got to do that by hand. Hmm. An automatic coil winder won't do that. If you're using round wire like most voice coils, you can just stick it on an automatic coil machine, psh, 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 you know, and it, and it winds it. The problem with round wire is they're round, so there's little air gaps between where all the round spaces are and they're stacked together. Well, right. that means you have less metal, as we call it in engineering, in the gap. And the other problem with them is they're layered. You got a layer here, you got a layer on top of that. Well, the inside layer isn't exposed to the air, so it overheats. It limits the amount of power you can dissipate. Hmm. So in edge round coils, they're rectangular and they're stacked like this. There's no air gaps, and every coil is exposed to the air every turn. There's no multiple layers. So guess what? You get a more efficient speaker, especially in the mid-range. You have more power handling. So you get a speaker that's more responsive and more reliable. But right. it costs a lot more money. But if we make it ourselves, we can amortize those costs. Mm -hmm. We don't make the voice coil itself, but we build the speaker with the coil in it. And if you're going to uh, build a voice coil, you're going to put it in a, a magnetic structure that has a gap. Well, the bigger you make that gap that that coil sits in, the less efficient your speaker is. The tighter you make that gap, the more responsive and faster and more efficient the speaker is going to be and more power handling. The problem is, in a tight gap, you don't have room for things to flex. The coil will start rubbing. So what do you got to do? You can't use a cheap stamped metal frame. You got to use a die cast aluminum frame that's really solid that's got machine surfaces to mount all the parts to. Well, that's what we do. So these cabinets enjoy that kind of a uh, speaker construction. And uh, they can be smaller because we've designed the whole system to work together. These combos, they're gig combos. They're 800 watts and they will fill an auditorium. <laughs> you can right. really hit them, you know, with a lot of power. Right. And on top of that, they're lightweight. Yeah. So let's see, 
Did I get off the course here? Or are we? Uh... No, that's 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 right on there. That's a, that's that's amazing. So it's a combination of of the design capability and then taking charge of the manufacturing yourself, so you can really manage all those details. Exactly. To uh, to make the the speaker as efficient and rugged, but still, man, the again the lightweight thing. We keep coming back to that, but yeah. I've carried my share of amplifiers, and I'm, I'm always happy to see <laughs> yes, something that's... Yes, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not the only people making the lightweight stuff these days. A lot of people do, and... Uh, but they, you guys, you guys were kind of the, the oh, forerunners oh, on all ab- that stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, we led that charge. Yeah, yeah. Always have, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And all the, oh, all the magnets in these new speakers, they're all neodymium, of course, which is way lighter than ceramic. Right. Anything to bring the weight down. Anything to bring the weight down. That's awesome. So you've talked about the construction of the amplifiers, the cabinet, some of the components and things, but I would have to imagine that after, what now, four or five decades of making bass amplifiers, you've learned some things <laughs> to watch out for and things that you want to implement in your amps to make sure they're rugged and reliable and they're going to stand up for musicians. Right, yeah. It, well, yeah, the concept is buy it once. Right. right? That's, right. What, that's what we try to do. Our ampl- we know our amplifiers aren't cheap, and so, uh, but if the guy can just buy it once, of course they don't, they buy everything, some guys buy everything we make, but... You know, the idea is buy it once and, uh, and let it serve you for years and years and years. So mm-hmm. uh, in that vein, uh, we attacked the weak points that I've discovered in amplifiers over time that are unavoidable. Uh, our early amplifiers, like everybody in the industry, we use tin-plated connectors. And tin is fine, you know, it's, it's, it's a great connector material when it's young. But after you take the amplifier in and out of smoky and... Uh, a humid clubs and put it in the trunk of your freezing car and it's vibrating on this, you know, vibrating like crazy while you're rocking out. Over time, those tin connectors build little, little dams of uh, non-conductive material and eventually the connector becomes intermittent. It drives us crazy. When guys come in with an amp like that, we just replace all the cables. Hmm. We don't even try to figure out what it is and then it works you know, we don't hear from the guy again. Those are amps obviously out of warranty, but we still take care of them. So in these new amps, I decided to go the route that aerospace goes, which is gold on gold. And if you're gonna put a satellite up and spend a million dollars putting it there, you don't wanna have a cable problem. Right. (laughs) So yeah, we went gold on gold on all the connectors and we got rid of the cable harnesses. All the cabling is now replaced by multi-layer circuit boards that are shielded so there's four layers and all the traces are in the middle and there's ground planes on both sides, gold connectors on the ends. No more weird problems of noise getting into the cables, no more connector problems. Nice. So all these amplifiers use that, that kind of connection scheme. Uh, it's a little more expensive, but not a lot. Mm-hmm. But it's a lot more engineering to, do, to design instead of just sticking a cable harness in there. Sure. Sure. That's the main thing that's going on here that we did inside to you know, make them much more reliable. That's a big deal, though. We're a low-volume manufacturer. I mean, we really are a boutique company. People think we're a big company because we've been around for 50 years and there's GK amps everywhere, but we're really not a big company. So as a result of that, we don't build large quantities of products each time. And we'll build, I don't know, 100. Well, so if, uh, you know, if you make circuit boards in your amplifier and you try to get somebody out in the World, outside world to load 100 boards for you, they're going to say, thanks, but no thanks. You know, we want you to build 5,000. So we put in our own surface mount line. Hmm. It's a very high quality one. It's, a, it's a, a Panasonic surface mount line, which is the best that you can buy. And so we run all our boards uh, on our own, you know, surface mount line, pick and place machine. It does 35,000 parts an hour. Wow. You can hardly see it move. It's, bet, it's an yeah. amazing machine. <laughs> And by doing that, we can build a run of 100. And we also know that the parts that are in there are the parts that we've spec'd. So we're not relying on some contractor to, you know, to save some money and put in a part that isn't what we want. We have real control over the quality of what's going in these products. 
So you mentioned the speakers, and you did talk about the construction of the speakers and the edge mount coils and things. But the the speaker is only one part of that. The other part of that is the cabinet. And I guess anybody could build a box and put a speaker in there and maybe drill a hole for a port. But there's more to it than that, isn't there? Yeah, that's a you know that is a great question. Thank you. Yeah, you, you, I can tell you've been doing this job. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you, you know exactly what to ask. So there is some math involved in in specking out a cabinet. Uh, but there's some black art too, and the math gets you in the neighborhood. But then you, <laughs> you got to get out there with the table saw and, and make things, cut things, change the port lengths and so forth. Uh, bracing is critical. It's kind of like a violin. Mm -hmm. These cabinets are filled with braces all over, you know, front to back, sides, top, all over the place. Uh, critically placed braces. The idea is to stop the side panels in the back from vibrating, because guess what? If they're vibrating, they're out of phase with the, what's coming out the front of the speaker, and that energy tends to cancel at times, giving you that ripply response. So you gotta really brace these things in the right place, too. You know, mm -hmm. you wanna kill those resonances that happen on any piece of natural wood, just tap the top of a guitar, you know? Sure. It's gotta resonate in the right way. That's part of it, and that you can't calculate. That's cut and try. Mm. It's my least favorite part of the job, because <laughs> you have to, build something, glue a brace here or there or whatever, and then you got to listen to it, get other people to play it, and take it outside, and, oh, now it's doing this, you know, finally you get all these opinions, and you know, so you got to sort of damp out all of the undesirable effects. That takes a lot of time, but it's all got to be done, you know, by hand like that. You can't automate that part of it. And you're happy with all that. You, then you got the problems of the stuff coming out the port. And the stuff coming out the port is just as much of a problem as the stuff that comes out of the sides of the amplifier. What you want coming out of the port is the frequency is within about you know, an octave, on I, a half an octave on either side or an octave on either side of your low frequency that you want to produce. In our case, we do it at about 60 hertz, okay. which makes the cabinet good down to about 30. As you get up in the higher frequencies, the mid-ranges in particular, like one kilohertz, you do not want that coming out your port. One kilohertz coming out your port or two kilohertz or five kilohertz coming out your port there's going to be a frequency in there that exactly cancels what's coming out the front of your speaker. And so you're going to get a response. And if you plot it, you see it going like this, and it goes, boom. Oh, wow, what was that? Ooh, and there's a, there'll be a peak there. So you got to stop that stuff from coming out the port. So having a really stiff uh, box and properly tuned ports with good damping material, you can get a really good transient response from a ported cabinet. And it's articulate, smooth, and aggressive. And like you said, it's a, it can be small and still fill a big room or an auditorium Absolutely, or whatever and drive yeah. and handle well, all that power. And the beauty of the port is the uh, sound pressure level that your ear can hear, it develops as you move away from the port. So, uh, you know, you, in, you, you can throw this thing into the back of the back of the crowd easily right. with a ported cabinet. Well, a tribute to the success of that is, again, the, the range of players and styles that use these amplifiers, because it's not often that you see the same types of amplifiers and the same manufacturer's products being used by bass players who are driving distorted, heavy, crunchy, big you know, metal tones and also upright basses through those, those yeah. products, and getting a good sound out of both yeah. Is, yeah. A, is a big challenge, so that's I, a I agree. testimony. I, th I agree a thousand percent. Right, yeah. right, yeah. And cool. I've, tr I've tried to uh, make it a product for all players, and we've had a lot of success in that. As you say, you know, uh, well, a lot of those great players are no longer with us, but uh, I was gonna say Charlie Aiden, for example, but yeah. <laughs> he's he's no longer with us, unfortunately. Sure. Good guy, but um, yeah, but yeah, you guys like that, mm -hmm. you know, to Duff McKagan, mm -hmm. yeah, and you know, Christian, the greatest Christian artist, you know, are all over GK and uh, uh, some country. Mm -hmm. It's probably our weakest area is country, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Did he have not discovered it yet? Yeah. Ah, right. there you go. But now they will after yeah, this video. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, we appreciate you sitting down with us today and taking the time to educate us on what all goes into these amplifiers because it's easy to look at the box and see a box, but there's a whole lot that goes into all these products. And that, that's, a, like I say, a testimony to how hard you work in your vision of all these products. Well, thank you. Thank you for letting me uh, you know, spew all that uh, technical stuff out and hope right. I didn't put it, people to sleep. I learned a lot, so I, I appreciate it. Thank you very okay, much. Very cool. Great to see you. Yeah. Likewise. And also, we appreciate uh, Forrest giving us some. some some uh, demo playing there, great playing, and, uh, oh, and yeah. really showing off the sound of the amplifiers too. Yeah. So that was very, thanks for bringing him along. We appreciate both of you being here today. Yeah, well, thanks very welcome. much. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you for joining me. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. <laughs> <laughs>